This Monero Mateo video is sponsored by Cake Wallet. Safely store, send, receive, and trade your Monero on Cake Wallet on Android and iOS. All right, what's going on, guys? My name is Mateo. Welcome back to the channel. So we are going to talk about some interesting things today. Uh, I've been compiling this information for a little bit. I've been spending the last hour or so, you know, soaking through it, trying to, you know, siphon off the important stuff and uh, distill what it is you need to know. And we've talked about this throughout our lifespan here on the channel, talking about how. OFAC, FATF, they're going to increase their regulatory constraints on decentralized uh, financial systems that we're seeing here in crypto. And I think that a lot of people overlook this or they hand wave this off and they don't think that these are serious initiatives which are happening and they think that, ah, uh, well, you know, there's nothing they can do to stop Bitcoin. Again, the pride kicking in that we've talked about, which, you know, pride goeth before thy fall. I think a lot of people are indeed underestimating uh, what could be going on here in regards to regulation on Bitcoin and the threats to its permissionless nature. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. We're going to talk about mining centralization. I'm going to point some things out to you guys, which I think are going to be insightful in regards to um, centralization that maybe you weren't aware of. And so this will further embolden our case that um, it's prone to regulatory attacks. So again, it makes Monero look great. Monero, you can mine with a computer. People can just flip open a laptop anywhere in the world and mine this stuff. Um, now you want to be wary of what your internet service provider can see if you're in certain places like China, right? Um, but nevertheless, um, it, it's much more robust, especially with decentralized mining pools being introduced into the Monero ecosystem now, making it that much more uh, resistant to centralization. So that's all great stuff that's happening. A couple of housekeeping things first, guys. I'm really enjoying talking with a lot of you. Um, I've gotten to know a lot of you much better through your emails, through Proton, or uh, you know, you guys sending me stuff on Telegram. I got to know you, Lutz, today. You're awesome. You're great. Uh, and people from all different communities. You know, Darrow, Concealed Network, Pirate Chain, uh, Zano. I mean, I've gotten to know brilliant, brilliant people. And it's one of the great joys of this gig. And it's not just, you know, people from crypto. I've gotten to know a lot of great Christians out there. Uh, people who know a lot about theology. You guys have a very rich understanding of things. Like you, Archie, uh, it was good corresponding with you on our Michael Saylor video on our Odyssey, which, by the way, we couldn't post on YouTube. Go check it out on Odyssey, though. Um, by the way, just go follow us on Odyssey. Uh, we've talked about YouTube censorship here. Y'all's comments are still disappearing. Again, if I don't respond, um, well, I don't respond as much as I used to before because I'm getting more comments and I'm more busy with things. And, um, you know, I still try to, you know, reply frequently, but nevertheless, um, some of y'all's comments do, do get censored still. And so that's a problem. And we saw with Pompliano how his account was just shut off for like a day before it was reinstated. So there are some capricious things happening, given that we talk about cryptocurrencies, which could actually be problematic for the power structure here. Um, it, you know, it's highly likely, in my opinion, if our con if our channel continues to grow the way it has, which it's been great, welcome all the new subscribers, welcome everybody, then yeah, we could become a target. So that is something to put on your radar. But something I also want to do, uh, because one of you sent me a pirate chain donation. Thank you so much. And you had included a memo saying, thank you for using Odyssey. Well, you're welcome. And thank you for watching us on Odyssey. But I, I want to, you know, throw out this initiative here just to encourage you guys to donate because, you know, I'm a greedy money grabber. It's true. But nevertheless, I like to get the truth out. Truth over, uh, you know, money grubbing hands. Uh, gains come before or come after liberty and freedom. Right, right. Freedom first. Monero first. Uh, what did I say the other day? Uh, if you value gains more than freedom, you'll have neither. It's sort of like that Thomas, um, uh, shoot, uh, who's the guy? Benjamin Franklin Bill. I always mix up Thomas Edison with Ben Franklin for some reason. Maybe they look similar. But yeah, Ben Franklin is like, if you surrender your uh, liberty for security, you'll have neither. And goodness, are we now figuring that out. But yeah, um, if you guys want to donate, include a memo and I'll do it like a super chat, you know, at the beginning of our shows, you know, I'll give you a shout out. And if you want to say something, I'll be sure to say it to the crowd. It'll, it'll be like a private 
crypto based super chat. So I'm hoping maybe that's uh, an initiative. Um, so that's cool. That's cool. And we've got like conceal network below. You can send encrypted messages through the conceal network, which is cool. You can also send messages through pirate chain, interestingly enough, if you uh, include that in your transaction in the memo section. And I think you can do the same thing with Cape Wallet if you want to send me uh, Monero. So yeah, you could do that as well. Or you could just become a patron, which we love our patrons. Thank you, Ken, for upping your membership, brother. Um, you're almost at the captain level. I would take a look at our tiers and ranks in case you had a question, because if you're a captain, uh, that means that you could ask me a question once a month. Josh, I'm still looking for your question, brother. And uh, I make a video on it. I answer it. Any topic that you want. We've talked about Orthodox Christianity. We've talked about evolution and some other interesting things because of our wonderful patrons. So I just wanted to throw that out real quick. Wanted to uh, give a little thing there for you guys. I love you. Our community is growing and that's really, really optimistic for me. And you guys keep the wind in my sails and that's all great. So with that being said, let's just dig into the content. I uh, hope that you guys are doing well. And I'm sorry, I thought I fixed this camera zoom thing. You're just going to have to deal with it. We're in the flow. We can't stop. So let's dig in here. Uh, where am I going? Not there, not there, not there. I have so many tabs open. I'm sorry. I'm like going crazy on everything that's going on. Okay, cool. So let's start with what OFAC is. Let's talk a little bit about FATF as well. So with just one paragraph, an agency of the U.S. government may have just radically altered the dynamics of the cryptocurrency ecosystem. And mind you, we've read this on the channel before. It was probably a month ago um, when we were just figuring out about this stuff. But this was written back in 2018. You'll be able to see how things have evolved in the last three years because uh, the person in this article is like, yeah, it may go this direction. Yeah, I mean, maybe we're just being a little bit skeptical here. But, you know, it, it looks like they could blacklist people's crypto addresses. And we're going to see how that's going. It's going to be one of those things where it's like how it started and how's it going, <laughs> right? Uh, and, yeah, it's definitely expanded like wildfire. So, yeah. Um, the Office of Foreign Asset Control, OFAC, announced on March 19 that it was considering digital currency addresses associated with its list of persons and entities with whom U.S. persons and businesses are forbidden to transact business with. So what they're basically talking about is back in 2018, they were figuring, about, uh, they were figuring how to include addresses onto uh, their blacklists so that people couldn't transact with those addresses. Um, in a new section of its website labeled questions about virtual currency, OFAC noted that it may add digital currency addresses to the specifically designated nationals list uh, to alert the public of specific digital currency identifiers associated with a blocked person. Now, how does that sound for you guys? Did you guys get a little chill down your spine when you heard blocked person? Um, because you know what's interesting is if you look at how many people have been banned off like social media websites, which by the way are basically like fascist organizations, which are extensions of the arms of the government, the current administration in particular. Um, well, I mean, it started with, you know, General Jones, who we talk about often, uh, Infowar guy, if you don't know who that is. And then it expanded to the president of the United States, right? And so when we see blocked person, that's not comforting, <laughs> you know? So it's another one of those things. It's not on people's radar because maybe they think they can't be affected by this. I assure you, this is a problem. So we'll dig into this here in a little bit, but just note that a blocked person, they want to alert the public, i.e. the mining pools, that you don't want to mine this guy's transactions. That's what that means. This list of specifically designated nationals includes individuals and entities associated with sanctioned governments. Uh, yeah, terroristas. Tra yeah, I don't know if I can say these words. Um, the moving, the mass moving of weapons of mass destruction and illegal substance moving. Uh, yeah, so that's what they say. Uh, it's going to move to like, you know, this person said something mean, shut them out of the economy, right? And we're seeing that, by the way, right now. Go check out our video on uh, Actually Urgent. They're rolling out the new economic system. Um, yeah, if you don't have the stabby, if you don't have the passport, the digital ID, you can't buy or sell the Mark of the Beast system, right? So that's coming right now. And, you know, this is just the start. This is how they convince people that, oh, I mean, they're just going after those dangerous people. They're, they're never going to come after me. Um, well, once the camel gets its nose under the tent, uh, yeah, I mean, who knows what could happen and yeah, 
This list includes varying types of records, including in some cases only names, but in other cases names, addresses, aliases, etc. Right. And, uh, you know, they don't like what you're saying on social media. Who knows? Financial institutions would be required to screen any virtual currency address provided for a transaction against a list to be provided by OFAC and to either report, deny service to, or block transactions involving any listed addresses. Now, guys, again, the fact that this is possible to do with Bitcoin, and yeah, you see some copes like, oh, well, you need 51%. Not necessarily true. But the fact that people are like, oh, well, that's not going to happen because it would require 51% of the hashes being regulated by these entities. First off, I mean, if you're dealing with OFAC and FATF, and by the way, if you don't know what FATF is, it's basically the international uh, embodiment of OFAC. We'll just read this real quick. Um, Yeah, OFAC was created by the G7 1989 in in response to growing concern about money laundering. Uh, FATF's mission is to monitor members' progress and implementing necessary measures to remove review money laundering and uh, terrorist uh, financing techniques and countermeasures. So again, it's all about the war on terror. Uh, We've seen how that's affected our rights here, uh, and now they're moving that into the financial sphere. Um, Isn't it amazing how much government expansion has been justified by, uh, you know, the events of 2001, the tragic events, by the way, God bless. Um, But, Check, take a look at this. Um, well, before we get to that, we just see what the FATF is up to, and that's going to play into the Lightning Network. Check this out. The Financial Action Task Force is the global, excuse me, global money laundering and terrorist financing watchdog. Well, I'm just going to say the intergovernmental body sets international standards that aim to prevent these illegal activities and the harm they cause to society. Oh, no. Goodness. It would be a shame uh, if governments... Uh, caused uh, problems and harm to society. Has that happened before? Have you guys experienced that? Uh, I've never read a history textbook, so I'm ignorant. Uh, As a policymaking body, the FATF works to generate the necessary political will to bring about national legislative and regulatory reforms in these areas. And so this is key, with more than 200 countries and jurisdictions committed to implementing them. Right, so they're everywhere. It's a global organization. And we're seeing more global regulatory uh, structures being built. I mean, just the other day, they ratified the global minimum tax. And we've talked about this on the channel. There are going to be global international tax regimes. And in the articles that we have read, go check out our AI tax and blockchain video, they recommend that countries give up a certain level of sovereignty and a certain level of control over their own tax administration in order to make it so that global tax administration becomes easier right? And they're going to embed tax in a computer code, which is going to become interoperable with public blockchains, likely the CBDC as well. And so everything's going to be taxed like automatically all over the place. And so all that's going to also be in regulatory alignment and compliance with FATF and OFAC, I would would suggest. Um, And something to note, um, yeah, the... Financial Action Task Force has delegations, which also includes the members of the Departments of State and Justice, the National Security Council, federal financial regulators, um, and they represent the U.S. at FATF meetings uh, to implement actions domestically to meet the U.S. commitment to FATF. So the FATF uh, organization influences OFAC and how it is we crack down on the things that we had mentioned before and perhaps in the future you and your bitcoin financial life so that's just something to look out for and just an extra cool little piece of information that i haven't heard reported this is the first time that i saw this but check this out uh the latest guidance and this was released earlier this year back in march i didn't hear anything about this but check this out uh the new updates uh from fatf the new guidance encourages heightened restrictions and surveillance on virtual asset service providers or FA or VASP. And mind you guys, I haven't had sugar today. I'm trying to cut down my sugar. So if I'm a little bit off, that's why Uh, I I need that sugar. I should go get my ice cream right now. I got to stop. No, I can't. I can't. The latest guidance includes expansion on what constitutes 
VASPs and could potentially be interpreted as including Lightning Network node operators. This type of categorization would require participants to collect vast amounts of information on the activities of others and could essentially prohibit KYC-free use of decentralized networks. So it says it right there, guys. I mean, it's cut and dry right there. If you use a public blockchain, they're going to be watching you. Uh, it's not going to be KYC. We've talked about this so much on the channel, we, we don't need to go back over this. But yeah, they're going to do away with KYC uh, or non-KYC, excuse me, stuff. Uh, everything's going to be KYC. You know your customer. Uh, you're going to need intel and information given to the government in order to get involved in crypto is basically what they're going to try to set up here. Um, and something interesting that I pointed out on my Twitter it's just speculation, but I think it struck a nerve. It struck a chord of truth. And I think it's not divinatory, but I think that this is coming. Let me just say this. And we've been ahead of the curve since day one. So look, I have a decent track record. And you guys have as skeptical a position of the government as I do. So I don't think I have to get uh, explain this too much. But here, let me just... I think that... The IRS saying to the banks that you need to report withdrawals and transactions on each account that has over $600 of withdrawals and transactions, you need to report that to the IRS. That could be translated to cryptocurrency addresses. What do you guys think? I'd like to hear your comments on that. I think that if you have a cryptocurrency address, maybe they categorize that as a little miniature financial institution. Maybe they categorize that as a mini bank or something. I don't know. These people are crazy, right? And so if they do that and you have a KYC linked wallet, which most wallets nowadays are, um, well, are, are you going to have to report or register your cryptocurrency address to the IRS? I, I think that's coming. And we've talked about this since the beginning of the channel. I think at some point you're going to have to register your cryptocurrency addresses. And what, I mean, that's going to make privacy coins... Uh, freedom coins go nuclear, obviously, but that's just something to think about. I think that's coming. What do you guys think? Do you think that it's possible that you'll have to register your cryptocurrency address to the government if you have a certain threshold which is reached, which would be reached by most people, by the way, which is the case with this banking initiative? Just a question that I have. So I thought that was interesting. Uh, they are going to uh, have node operators on the Lightning Network collect vast amounts of information and i think that the lightning network is going to be highly centralized um now el salvador is an obvious example of this i mean everything is completely centralized the government runs the custodial wallets over there <laughs> i mean i i thought the lightning network was going to be centralized i didn't think it'd be that centralized we'll see how that rolls out in different countries we'll see how this develops but um yeah i think it's going to be more centralized and we've talked about reasons for that we're not going to get into that but uh, that's going to pose issues. And it's not as private as people think. Uh, there have been reports on that we've talked about. Uh, nevertheless, so let's go back to this article here talking about FATF. Who decides what addresses are added to the SDN list? OFAC is operated by the Department of Treasury, which currently maintains and updates the SDN list. It appears that the existing SDN list will be updated to include addresses associated with individuals and entities already listed by OFAC, and that OFAC is encouraging others to provide additional data to associate addresses listed with individuals and entities. Maybe you get a reward for uh, reporting people's addresses to the government at some point. Think about that. Uh, and this is something that I was concerned about with the regulation that was being debated a couple months ago, if you, go, if you all remember, um, where they talked about having uh, node operators, miners, uh, wallet um, providers, et cetera, be considered brokers, where, I mean, pretty much everyone turns into a broker at that point. And if you're sending crypto to somebody, you're going to have to report that transaction, which means that you're going to have to give not only your address information, but your other party's address information to the government. Um, again, I see that coming. I think the bill uh, wasn't as bad as initially considered in regards to that. I would need to look back over that information, but that was one of the big debates. It's like, oh, we're going to have to report all of our transactions all the time. This is going to be crazy. Well, they want all this information. You guys know that, right? They want as much information on you and your crypto activity as possible. 
and they're going to roll out regulation to do this. It's not that complicated. Uh, I wouldn't trust these people at all. You see a lot of coping going on where people are like, oh, man, well, uh, we can lobby the government. We're going to make the crypto caucus and things like this. Just like, no, stop it. Just just get into Monero and hold on. <laughs> right? Uh, don't make it too complicated. They want to suck your wealth out. It's not that hard to figure out. Uh, what is a digital currency address? Or excuse me, what if a digital currency address is wrongfully associated with a blacklisted individual? There is an appeal process available. <laughs> uh, yeah, whatever. You got to divulge your identity and contact info to OFAC. And so that's interesting, right? So maybe OFAC suspects you of um, doing things under the table that they don't know about. And so uh, maybe they just go ahead and blacklist you. It's like, hey, this guy's being a little bit sketchy. We're going to throw him on the list. Don't process his transactions. And then you got to go through an appeal process where they verify your information and then you're on the grid, right? So just another thought that I have. If you appeal, expect a long conversation with the regulator. <laughs> hey, uh, regulator, do you have pirate chain by any chance? Uh, could you unlock my account? R matey? Um, okay, so taint by association, we've talked about this. Is it possible that received coins would then be tainted as being linked back to an individual or entity that your identity and digital currency address may be added to the OFAC list? Yes, that's what they say. It's possible, right? You could get added to the OFAC list because you had received tainted Bitcoins. Now, just just think about that for a sec, guys. If it becomes possible that OFAC and FATF get powerful enough to where they can censor Bitcoin payments, which, as we're about to go through, is not that out of the realm of possibility. Okay, what agents of the state could do is they could have Bitcoin in their coffers, which they seize from other criminals, right? And we've seen this before, uh, where they just hold on to Monero or they hold on to Bitcoin, which they seize from criminals, and then they use that to honey trap other people. This has happened before. We, we just went through this yesterday, <laughs> in fact, um, with that nuclear scientist, right? Um, but what if they don't like you, and then they set you up? with this tainted Bitcoin. And so you receive this tainted Bitcoin for whatever good and service that you're providing. It ends up being some F, uh, BI agent or some agent of the state. And then they put you on the list. They put you on the list. Uh, and they'll say, hey, it uh, looks like you received this Bitcoin, which we can trace back to some criminal entity. And maybe they can do that, right? Because it's actually from a criminal entity that they seized the Bitcoin from. And then... In order for you to get off this OFAC list, you've got to give them your intel. You've got to give them your information. So that's just crazy. That's something to consider. And at that point, if people are suspecting this, I imagine everyone's going to be using a different wallet for everything. And at that point, the you know burden that's going to be on you to use these public blockchain cryptos, I mean, either you're going to use the central bank digital currency or you're going to use uh, you know Monero or something like this. You're not going to use some of these other public blockchain cryptos. Um, I would use Monero instead of the CBDC, if that wasn't clear, by the way. Uh, it is unclear as to whether OFAC intends to add new addresses. Yeah, and we'll get to that. They've added hundreds of new addresses. But it is clear that any transaction with an illicit actor who's listed on the SDN list is prohibited and can result in penalties. That will apply, of course, to centralized mining operations, which are public entities. Right? And that's not going to be hard to administer. Uh, this may kick off, yeah, uh, so here we go. If OFAC uses blockchain tracing software, which they do, to identify the counterparty to transactions with listed digital currency addresses, it may add the addresses of those counterparties to the SDN list, like we talked about, right? Uh, so your tainted Bitcoin becomes like an infection <laughs> that goes through the blockchain, which adds everybody therein onto this list. And who knows, maybe these Bitcoins go so far and it adds so many people to the list. Maybe they have an automatic methodology by which they add people to this list um, to where then you have to plead your innocence to get off of this list. You, you know, it's sort of like uh, guilty before proven innocent, right? Uh, you're just put on the list because you got this Bitcoin and then you have to prove your innocence. And that likely means they're going to go through all your stuff. They're going to go through the blockchain. They're going to go through your address and see what it is you've been up to. 
how excited are you about that? Uh, yeah, right? Based on this person, that's completely possible. This could quickly multiply the number of addresses on the SDN list and would likely include addresses for individuals and entities that are not currently there. So get excited, guys. <laughs> get excited. Bitcoin's awesome, isn't it? Uh, Bitrec King. I just want to make sure I properly cited this guy. So yeah, that's seriously problematic. Um, do I need to explain that to you? Of course not. What if a digital currency address is listed as the address used by a third-party provider, a multi-sig provider? Um, it is unclear, but the addition of a multi-sig wallet provider uh, provider's digital currency address to the SDN list could affect all users of that custody provider service. Oh, man. So just think about this, right? You know about multi-sigs. If you know about the Lightning Network, uh, multi-sig wallets are basically wallets that have a collection of Bitcoin in there from multiple addresses, except it's one wallet. Uh, well, that can affect everybody who's involved in that multi-sig wallet. Uh, that's problematic. So just another vector by which this infection of tainted Bitcoin could spread. Uh, customers of that multi-sig wallet may find that their funds may be blocked. Uh, I, I didn't read this whole thing, by the way, uh, before I got into it. Typically, I just look for articles, guys, and then I go through it when we're talking on here. I react in real time. I, I don't read every single one of these before we get into it. It just, ha it just so happens that we run into really key information as we do. That's how I'm able to put out as much content as I do. I just pull a lot of this stuff up, and it's like, cool, let's get through it. And I skim over it, obviously, but like, uh, are you guys listening to what I'm saying to you? I mean, this was written in 2018. It's gotten much worse now. You can guarantee it, but look. Customers of that multi-sig wallet could find that their funds may be blocked and thus not able to transact, uh, be transacted through any financial institution. Remember, business transactions with listed individuals and entities are prohibited. Yeah, and so what I imagine is going to happen is there's going to be an institution that grows around this problem. And, and that's typically how a lot of money is made. A lot of money is made on inefficiencies. A lot of money is made on problems, of course, which is what, one reason why you can't trust the state to fix all their problems. And this is why we see the FBI setting up so many of their own people and encouraging people to cause problems because they can then look like the hero for fixing it when really they probably don't even have too much to do. And so it justifies their paychecks, justifies them getting paid. So just think about this. We're going to get to this later in this video. This is going to be a long video, by the way. But think about this, right? So you have blockchain forensics analytical companies that work with the government, that work with exchanges. Who knows how powerful these groups are going to become? And you see the digital currency group. Uh, go check out our digital currency group series. Super key. We see them invested in like over a dozen blockchain analytics companies. And so if these companies get entrenched enough, uh, they're going to be very gung-ho to expand the regulatory apparatus of the state on the Bitcoin blockchain network. Now, why is that? Because if people are going to be freaked out about getting tainted Bitcoin, lest they get uh, you know, government penalties or they get caught up in what we were just talking about with OFAC blacklists, which could seriously affect people's businesses, and et cetera. Well, people are going to seek out these forensics analytical companies as contractors and hire them so that they could look through whatever Bitcoin that they're receiving in normal day-to-day -day operations of good provisioning or service providing, right? And so there's going to be an incentive there uh, to lobby the government for more regulation, actually. And so you're going to see this again, and we'll get to this soon, where Blockstream, uh, which is Adam Back's company, they're working a lot on Bitcoin mining. They are working with an Australian investment bank, which is also invested in other Bitcoin mining, which, again, is going to play into the whole centralization theme that we're going to get to. They are working on having carbon neutral Bitcoin mining operations. Okay. So what does that tell you? Well, first off, we've heard this uh, meme much before, and this is nothing new, that uh, Bitcoin uses a lot of energy. It's not environmentally friendly. You know, Kevin... O'Leary, he wants to get Bitcoin that's straight off the hashes, right? And he doesn't want Bitcoin from China uh, because those are blood Bitcoins. It kills the environment, blah, 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 right? So that's already a thing. If it becomes a thing to mine Bitcoin with carbon neutral efforts, 
which are probably going to be prohibitively expensive to achieve. Well, it could be that entities like Adam Back's Blockstream, which you can't imagine, oh my God, Adam Back going to the government. Just, just think about this. What if these entities, which have the money, which have the economies of scale to pull off carbon neutral mining of Bitcoin, what if they go to the government and they say, hey, uh, you know, it might be a good idea that we all mine Bitcoin carbon neutrally uh, and only entities which are registered with the government and have a proven plan to mine Bitcoin uh, environmentally, only they can be involved in this market. Only they could get a permit. Only they could be registered to mine Bitcoin. You don't think that could happen? Just think about this, guys. That would make Adam Back and Blockstream more money. And that would make Mike Novogratz, Goldman Sachs boy, who is head of Galaxy Digital, who invests in Blockstream, and who also invests, by the way, in another European uh, Bitcoin mining operation, the biggest in Europe, as far as I'm concerned, called Bitfury, I believe, which also owns Cypher Mining here in the United States. Again, more centralization. But think about this, right? If they go carbon neutral, these big, big mining firms, it's going to be similar to what you see in oil. And in oil, you have the big oil companies, which, contrary to what a lot of people believe, invest in these green environmentalist initiatives. Now, why would they do that? Well, one, you could say that they want to appeal to the crowd. They want to have the mob off their back. Hey, look, by the way, we just you know, gave Greenpeace like a billion dollars. Leave us alone, right? It's sort of like getting the mob off your shoulders so to maybe prevent further regulation. But at the same time, at the same time, think about this. If they tack on enough regulation to the oil mining process, well, that's going to serve as a big barrier of entry for many other competitors. Because as of now, to open, like, ugh, excuse me, if they open up a new oil rig, just a company that wants to start getting after it to, you know, get oil on the ground and join the market, well, they're going to have to go through like a 10-year patent process. They're going to have to spend billions of dollars before they get one cent out of the ground. And so, again, barriers of entry out the bullocks, right? John Rockefeller, he was just setting up these things in his back freaking yard. No regulation, no permits, no, none of that. He just stuck a straw on the ground and starts sucking the oil out. You can't do that nowadays. He'll go to jail. You'll, have, you'll pay fines to where, you know, even if you're a Rothschild, it's going to hurt, right? So, like, think about this, right? Think about this. And so that could be translated over to Bitcoin mining. The Bitcoin miners, which are already established and already have an environmentally friendly uh, setup, they could lobby to make that the status quo so that they could take more market share. You understand how this works? So that would cut out many of the little guys, and then that would consolidate more power and more mining hashes to uh, you know, the likes of Blockstream who is invested in by the Digital Currents Group, which is invested in by MasterCard, which is run by CFR, Trilateral Commission, and the Global East is right. And we did a video on Blockstream specifically. Go check out the Bitcoin Black Pill video. We did that a while ago. Uh, thank you, Josh, for bringing that up. I do remember you reaching out to me and saying, hey, you need to look into this. And that was honestly the beginning of this big adventure that I had uh, because all of this stuff that we're going through, all the stuff that, you know, I talk about to some degree, oh, like recently, it's just new information. And a lot of that was set in place by this crazy uh, rabbit hole I went down back then. So go check that out. Bitcoin black pill, that rabbit hole is pretty interesting. Uh, looking at who's behind that. And when you take what we just talked about into context, um, you know, it, it makes you think that that's, quite a possibility. So just, I want to note that, and that plays into our conversation about OFAC. So how likely is it that a transaction is reported? So you could read all this stuff. We're kind of digging deep into all of this, but you get the point. OFAC has the capacity to censor people that are transacting in Bitcoin or transacting on any public blockchain, because as we'll get to here, this is recent. Uh, this goes to May 2021. And, you know, from 2018, they've just been going crazy with adding addresses to their blacklist. I mean, the cat's out of the bag at this point. OFAC recently added crypto addresses to its sanction list. It contains Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, Ethereum, Litecoin, Dash. Notice Dash, okay? You guys notice that? Uh, privacy coin? Is it a privacy coin? Because, you know... I, 
I don't see Monero on here. And, you know, interesting, I see Zcash, too. I see Verge, too. I thought these were privacy coins. I must have been mis mistaken. Uh, yeah, so no Monero, no Pirate Chain, none of that right here. So interesting to note. Uh, but, yeah, they're going crazy with adding addresses on the list. So that's something to note. And so if you're on a public blockchain, they're going to be able to get you. They're going to be able to cut you out. So that's the main point that I want to get to there. And it, it gets pretty complicated here. Again, you could read all this. We didn't even... Yeah, so he says right here... Oh, they talk about the Lightning Network too. So check it out. How does the Lightning Network get affected? If the Lightning Network is deemed to be a money transmitter, Lightning Network node operators may have to comply and either refuse or block transactions involving listed addresses. So again, if this stuff becomes ever more established, that's going to be more overhead for Lightning Network operators. And if you're a small Lightning Network operator, you're barely making any money anyway. And you have to give up a lot of Bitcoin uh, because you have to stuff your channels with liquidity so that people could pass through you. And the rate of interest that you're getting for putting your Bitcoin on the Lightning Network so other people could use that liquidity channel is negligible. And so why not just go on BlockFi? Why not spend your Bitcoin on something which is going to give you a better return? Um, that to me is an obvious. And so again, that's going to encourage more centralization. Um, and then if like banks get involved, they're going to be watching everything you do. And the Lightning Network already has something called a uh, watchtower node. Go check that out where they're looking out for fraud, right? So how does this affect fungibility? Kiss fungibility goodbye. Expect a premium on freshly minted coins or traced clean coins on the market. Right. So again, fungibility gone away with. And Adam Back, he even said in a tweet, he's like, oh, well, the most valuable Bitcoin you have is the Bitcoin that nobody knows about. It's just like, bro, right there. You just said that Bitcoin has a fungibility problem. Do you even realize this? Surely he has to realize this. He's a smart guy, but nevertheless. We talked about that with Kevin Watt. Check out that interview. It's key. This may cause a bifurcation in price between what was otherwise a functionally clean asset and dirty coin. Right, we saw that with Kevin O'Leary. What about tumblers and mixers? Yeah, they're going to be made illegal. Uh, that's not going to be easy to use, especially if you have to register your crypto address. And tumblers and mixers, uh, they have ways of seeing whether or not somebody's using that. As far as I've been able to read, we went over that a while ago in our Bitcoin mixing video, and I've looked up more information, which seems to deem that to be the case. And we talked about that with Arctic Mind, too. He said that, yeah, the problem with Bitcoin mixers is that the amount that goes into a mixer is the same amount that comes out. Um, that's abnormal for cryptocurrency transactions or transactions of any kind. You give an amount, and then you get the same amount back. What is the purpose of that transaction other than to wash your coins, Right. Uh, or do something else, which is questionable, which is going to raise flags, which is going to heighten the risk premium on your coins, and that's going to make exchanges be skeptical of those Bitcoins, right? So consider that. What do we have? We have so much content to get to. This is going to be like a three-hour video. I hope you guys are fine with that. This Will coins be permanently marked if they are transacted to or from a listed address? Nobody knows this. Okay, well, yeah, this is all... Pretty old stuff. You can get into all this. Really good content here. Uh... <laughs> yeah, so check this out. Uh, could this backfire? What's the doomsday scenario? Sure, operators of listed digital currency addresses could spray Satoshis at any address they find and essentially taint the entire blockchain. As we talked about, exactly. Uh, after listing addresses and implementing appropriate tracking software, OFAC may find that all addresses are two or three transactions away from a listed address, and the tool becomes essentially worthless. But does it? Does it? Maybe they want a lot of people on the list, and then people have to plea to get off the list and show their innocence, right? Just something to think about. But that is funny. That is kind of funny. So that's our first article. That's where things started back in 2018. People got skeptical of this. And mind you, when they started the black coin or <laughs> when they started to black uh, list Bitcoin addresses, Bitcoin should have went to zero. Like, guys, look at these cryptos right here. They should all be zero as far as I'm concerned. All of them should be zero. Uh, if they can track and trace your coins and there is the potential for you to be censored, uh, 
Get out of here with that. I don't want to have anything to do with that. That's ridiculous. Uh, cryptocurrency and OFAC. Beware of the sanctions risks. So this is a little bit more thicker of a text. Over the past year or so, OFAC has issued a number of subpoenas to virtual currency businesses such as exchanges regarding possible customers and transactions involving parties in sanctioned countries. Right. So, just more activity. Interesting stuff. There's something specifically here that I wanted to get to. Yeah, so crypto exchanges are going to register with FinCEN, which is the Financial Enforcement Network, which works for the government. They are probably tracking a lot of stuff that's going on. Yeah, more KYC, sanction screening, identify parties trading on their exchanges, employ geo IP blocking to prohibit any parties from sanctioned jurisdictions. Yeah, and, and that's an interesting thing we read about where I believe it was Cypher Trace who was like getting into a lot of the data, which was on Block Explorer, I believe. This is a little bit older of a story, a few weeks. Um, but they were scraping up people's IP addresses, and they were able to link those IP addresses with people's Bitcoin addresses. And therefore, they were able to find out who you were. So that's going on. Nobody had any idea that could even happen. But nevertheless, that's what they're doing. So... Uh, that is not great. Uh, bu -bu -bu -bu. So this guy has a good update for us. This is October 14th, 2020. I do remember reading this one. Uh, yeah, so they use analytics. Washington is keen to act decisively against crypto-related cybercrime. Threatens the integrity of digital finance, whatever. And that's what they'll say. Uh, so, yeah, exactly. They started with blacklisting Iranian nationals and Chinese nationals. So, again, I mean, they're starting with the typical suspects. And then they're going to expand. As he says here, this year has seen a marked increase in the price at which U.S. authorities are moving against crypto crime. In September 2020, OFAC blacklisted its 50th Bitcoin address, the second such listing in a month. Together with civil asset forfeitures taken under the DOJ, more than 700 cryptocurrency addresses and accounts have been seized and sanctioned by U.S. authorities in the last seven months. Uh, they're going to up those numbers, guys. <laughs> they're going to up those numbers. Um, that's a lot of what I wanted to get to there. They're sanctioning North Koreans, too. That's no surprise. Yeah, so this is something really key I want to point out here. Uh, earlier last month, OFAC moved against Russian actors. Here we go. The Ruskies. Used a lot, utilizing virtual assets to channel funds in efforts to subvert U.S. elections. Okay, so how many claims of election subverting have you heard in the last five years? Many, many. And this was used as a pretext to kick people off of social media sites, like thousands of people, thousands upon thousands of people were kicked off of social media sites because of election disinformation or questioning the election or getting accused of subverting the election. So is OFAC going to look at those people and say, hey, blacklist, blacklist those people's addresses. They're trying to undermine our democracy or something like this. Just think about that. That's key. Just more excuses they're going to use to go after you. The acknowledgement of such activity is shocking, but not unexpected. Right. And it's not going to be unexpected to people like us when that starts to happen with everyday Americans. Seriously. I, I'm not going to be surprised. The first tantalizing, it, tantalizing clues of Bitcoin's use in election interference first emerged in special counsel Robert Mueller's report into alleged Russian involvement, which ended up being a big nothing burger, wasting a bunch of money, wasting a bunch of time. Among other things, the report indicated that the Russian military intelligence had used Bitcoin to purchase equipment for hacking operations. Interesting. And there was a rather unbelievable story earlier this year. You guys remember like when the meat packaging 
uh, processing plant or whatever was hacked. And then the Colonial Pipeline was hacked. And in both cases, the hackers demanded Bitcoin for ransom. And then the FBI was able to get that Bitcoin back. Now, will somebody explain that to me? <laughs> Is this another example of the FBI causing problems they didn't have in the first place to get more cred or to get more power or to get more leverage over crypto and to push that narrative? I don't know. It was deeply suspicious to me. Let me know what you guys thought. But yeah, it's the Ruskies at the end of the day, of course. Uh, is it possible to trace those addresses using block explorers? Yes, he says. Uh, as we talked about, block explorers, you can trace anyone's Bitcoin address, figure out their uh, balance, figure out who they're transacting with, everything. The data provides telling insights into the Russian state actors' funding. Now, how many people use crypto and they have their IP circuited to Russia? I imagine it's a lot of people. Um, that's just something I want to point out. Uh, ba, 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 ba. The emergence of analytics tools used by law enforcement has been critical. Yeah, and we've uncovered at least like 50 digital analytics companies who are getting up and started on these various public blockchains and work with the exchanges and the governments and everything. That, everything's going to be seen, guys. You're not going to be able to get away with anything. Um, now, different take than I would. Uh, say he says the robust and rational way enforcement has occurred bodes well for the digital asset sector clearly not that skeptical clearly uh quite okay with authoritarianism as far as i'm concerned uh ofac's actions against crypto related cybercrime are a tacit acknowledgement that digital assets are here to stay well not if you're against these guys or if these guys are against you uh you're not going to be here to stay on the blockchain Blockchain's core characteristics of transparency and immutability mean that it's ideal for analysis and investigation. Okay, this guy thinks that's a good thing, ladies and gentlemen. Let me read that again. Blockchain's core characteristics of transparency and immutability mean that it's ideal for analysis and investigation. Okay, so key point. He has a completely 180 view of what that means. Uh in my view, I mean, that's terrible. This is not good at all. No longer is the debate about prohibition once viewed with, well, no, no, incorrect, very incorrect. When they rule out the CBDC, we'll see what happens. Because there was coping in China, too. When there was coping in China, people were like, oh, well, they're just going after the crypto exchanges. We don't need to worry about it. They're going to let us keep trading. Oh, they're just going after the miners. They're just worried about the environmental stuff or they're worried about this and that. They can't ban crypto. They're not going to do that. And then they ban the crypto. It was a sequential process, mind you. And I suspect to some degree the same thing is happening here in the United States. It's going to be a sequential process. I mean, they're looking to set up uh, crypto task force, uh, and they're looking to do other things uh, to incorporate it into a regulatory framework. But my question is, at what point do they just say, hey, we want you to use our CBDC, in which case they incur massive penalties on people still using other cryptos, or they bribe you into the CBDC? Maybe it's sort of like a FDR 1933 type thing, right, where you got to turn in your Bitcoin and for your Bitcoin, maybe they pay you 10% premium of what the price is in the CBDC in order to get you onto the CBDC. I mean, I suspect that could happen. I mean, after all, these people can literally just print the money, right? Um, and given that everyone in Bitcoin is about the gains, yeah, why not? Um, just some comments there. Once viewed with suspicion, uh, the blockchain now finds itself an ally of government at the forefront of a sanctions war. I mean, just read that, guys. Come to your own conclusions. You know what I think about that. Um, this guy seems to be totally unaware. Well, check this out, right? This goes back to what we were talking about. He co-founded Alaco Analytics. So his job is going to be working with the government. Um, he's all about governments getting into public blockchains because that makes him money, right? So, again, more interests economically coming into the picture to have the government implement more regulatory frameworks so that they can make more money off this. Something to consider. And you can read more about this, the OFAC sanctions list. Pretty crazy that Dash, Zcash, and 
Verge on are on here. Verge is on the verge of not being a privacy coin or of being a privacy coin. It's not. Um, so check this out. OFAC has a risk indicator. And exchanges have the same thing too. So it's not so cut and dry where a Bitcoin is tainted or not. They have risk analytics. And if it goes over a certain threshold, I imagine that's when they act. So you could go through all that. Let's keep going. U.S. sanctions enforcer blacklist a crypto exchange for the first time. So you remember how we were just talking about how the vectors are expanding? Yeah. Now they're sanctioning exchanges. <laughs> it's not just crypto assets, guys. Uh, it's crypto exchanges. No. So we're starting to see where this is going, aren't we? September 21st, 2021. So this is recent. U.S. sanctions enforcer blacklist a crypto exchange. Um, Sue IO, I believe is how you pronounce that, specially designated national, putting the exchange in a category with suspected terrorists. Uh, yeah, so just check that out. Fight against ransomware. And the exchange was processing transactions from people who were on the sanctions list. Um, and so, yeah, they were sanctioned. And let's see. I think I recall them saying that any addresses associated now with doing business with this exchange are going to be added to the list, if I read this correctly. So let me see if I can find that. Okay, so they're trying to yeah, add more regulation as a result of this, build international efforts to ensure proper regulation, KYC, industry partnerships, and analytical abilities to support interdiction events. Yeah, so just more crackdown, right? So here's something key. The Treasury Department is focused on other types of crypto transaction facilitators, including mixers, and what role they may have to play in a legal transaction. So again, they're going to make those illegal. Um, like all this coin joining stuff, it's not going to work. We're going to continue to look at exchanges within the ecosystem and look at mixers to see whether and to look for other actions we can take for payments given the importance of protecting our national security. So, guys, whenever you see the word national security, you should get very insecure, <laughs> especially if you're in the nation where they're concerned about national security. Like, remember when we locked everything down and you were – uh, you know, essentially de facto welded into your house for national security. So, yeah, when you, whenever you see that, be uh, ears perked, right? Neither federal official said whether any specific mixer-related actions are forthcoming. But the U.S. Department of Justice has already warned that using mixers may, in and of itself, may be a crime. So it says it right there. And they can see whether you're using it, so... Again, just check out Monero, guys. I would look into that. The Freedom Coin Covenant, Conceal Network, Dara Monero, Power Chain. Xano, increasingly, I'm looking more into that. Pretty interesting stuff they're doing over there. So let's move on. But yes, they're sanctioning exchanges, main point. Uh, and so I imagine any addresses associated with that exchange are going to be added. I thought I saw that in here. I can't seem to find it. Maybe not. Yeah, so Chainalysis was doing the work. We've heard a lot about them. They're invested in by the Digital Currency Group. Right? Yeah, so cool. All right. So people are waking up to this. This was posted 12 days ago. OFAC compliance equals death. Correct. Uh, and you're going to see some coping here. We're on our Bitcoin, of course, so... Uh, somebody seems to be waking up and it is interesting that <laughs> his user is dash XMR dash. So maybe he's getting the word out dash XMR dash. If you watch our channel, love you. Thanks for getting the word out. This is great. Just a heads up. Miners can emphasis can censor transactions from blocks with server side checks against whitelists from governments slash chain analysis 
feeds. They're not forced by the protocol to include your dirty transactions into a block if they don't want to. Of course, there has not yet been an example of this happening in an organized fashion that I'm aware of. Well, we just went through some of that, actually. Uh, you should become aware of that, Mr. XMR guy. And I think you probably watched this channel. I, I wouldn't be surprised. Comment if you do. Uh, somewhere, somewhere, oh, excuse me, someone somewhere will always be willing to take your block. Cope. Doesn't matter if 51% of miners, and he mentions this point. So, doesn't matter if 51% of miners have a consensus not to take it, your block will still eventually be confirmed by one of the 49% remaining. Uh, well, how sure of you that? Because we'll get to this a little bit later. I might have to get some coffee. I might have to pause this. But Jiraj Bednar has done some interesting work. And he has concluded that it would really only take 10% of the hash rate being regulated by OFAC to influence the rest of the mining world to not mine your coins. And he goes through all of this stuff. I don't know if we'll be able to dig into it in detail. But, uh, yeah, that's pretty interesting, right? So he says here, a lot of people think this is purely about a over 50% attack. Not true. Here's how this unfolds with 10% censoring hash rates. And mind you, the title to this article is how regulators could successfully introduce Bitcoin censorship in other dystopias. Um, Bitcoin is often said to be anonymous and uncensorable thanks to chain analysis. Anonymity is to some extent disputed wishful thinking of the past. Uh, and it looks like it won't be so nice with censorship either. Uh, and we'll get to this comment he made here about block Sears pool. We're seeing other mining exchanges, uh, or sorry, mining pools uh, link up with OFAC requirements. So we'll get to that here in a little bit. But you could dig into the arguments behind that, or we'll just get to it later. But I do want to say that there is reason to suspect that you don't need over 50% of the miners to be regulated uh, in order to have your transaction not go through. It could be 10%, it could be 20%, and there seems to be a dynamic where the more miners that are complying with OFAC regulations in FATF, the more costly it is for people who don't want, don't want to comply with FATF, even if they're not undergoing a particular regulation, to include your transaction into the block. Um, and it gets exponential um, in opportunity cost as more comply with the regulations. That's his take. Uh, I'd like to hear your comments if you're tech savvy and you understand this subject in detail, but this is what he's saying. Theoretically, sure. However, this is what XMR is saying. He puts up a heroic defense on this hill. I, I got to say, I got to clap for you, XMR. This guy, he was like on the Alamo here. Everyone just came after him. But look, oh yeah, everyone's like, oh, this is FUD, blah, blah, blah. Right. However, if I'm a big mining center and I have hundreds of millions of dollars worth of hardware, legal fees, and a very restrictive financial agency that is up my ass, and I have an easy-to-use feed where I can on-the-fly compare transactions to a list of bad addresses from Chainalysis or APIs that are downstream of the IRS, the DEA, the FBI, and other large financial interests. Do I want to risk scrutiny from financial agencies? Could I get audited? Am I responsible for servicing the payment of criminals? You can hope that the game theoreticals work out in the ways you anticipate, but why not go ahead and address this technological capability as a shortcoming, which it is. The fact that this risk exists at all is a problem. It's a fundamental problem. Um, no one entity or even a consensus will ever agree enough to manage a 51% attack to force this centralization, which is the response. Uh, after everything that we've read, I will let you guys come to your conclusions about that. Seriously, I'll let you guys come to your conclusions. Uh, first of all, I hold Bitcoin. Uh, yeah, he's been involved. He's making the ethos case. This is who I am. I know what I'm talking about. There is nothing, uh, emphasis nothing, 
regardless of protocol consensus or pool proportions that prevents miners from querying a blacklist and not including transactions with taint from those addresses and blocks or sending them off to other exchanges. Not only is this already happening right now, but we are seeing an unprecedented push for further financial surveillance and various attempts to control the project. You have no counter argument. Nothing prevents the censorship and freezing of funds by miners refusing to do business with certain transactions. Nothing. That's not hypothetical. You're just too short-sighted. And he gets a little ad hominem me here. You know? Sounds like he's making a lot of money from Bitcoin. Good for you. Yeah, so he makes more arguments. This is an interesting feed to check out, but he makes some pretty good arguments. <laughs> They're talking about... Uh, well, one interesting thing here is this is the, I guess, kind of people you run into on the uh, <laughs> the our Bitcoin sector. Uh, but this guy says how governments mining Bitcoin could de-risk cryptocurrency. Yes, you just read that right. This guy literally makes the case right here that uh, the government mining Bitcoin, you see, is going to de-risk the cryptocurrency. In other words... There's no risks involved with governments mining Bitcoin, of course. It's going to make it that much more safe to use uh, until they just say, hey, uh, you can't buy or sell, which they're literally doing right now. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, cope. Ba -ba 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 -ba. So let's go to what Jiraj was talking about in this recent post that we just briefly looked at. Blocks here, and this is from November 2020. This is by Inside Bitcoins. Uh, this article is by Coindesk. Let me just make sure I give adequate credit. Score chain. Uh, this is by FCPA blog. And this is from jdsupra.com. So I hope that you guys are still awake. I know we're digging through some deep stuff today. This is pretty dense. I'm with you. It's pretty late here. It's almost 11, um, but we're still going strong. We've got to let people know about this. We've got to get it out. Um, so thank you for staying with me. Let me know your comments. Uh, please like and share and all that stuff if you haven't already. Bloxier, a blockchain analytics platform, has recently launched the private beta version of its new Bitcoin mining pool. What makes this mining pool, aptly named Bloxier Mining, Stand out over the rest is its ability to censor transactions being made from blacklisted wallets. Okay, so yeah, that's problematic. So, again, more, more OFAC activity. This means of keeping blacklisted transactions under control. This pool will leverage the labeling data of both Wallet Score, Blockseer, the U.S. Office of Foreign Assets Control, and other verified sources to gain and expansive blacklist for cryptocurrencies. Through this, the pool will be able to identify transactions uh, that it will refuse to process. All miners within this mining pool are also mandated to pass strict KYC protocols. Yeah, so this is happening. This is totally happening. He explained that this pool, the COO of the project, this pool prioritizes avoiding doing transactions being requested from wallets known as being used for malicious purposes. Now, just notice how broadly defined this could be. Malicious. Who knows what malicious is? Everyone's throwing around these words like hate, malicious, and things like this. Um, who knows how this could be defined? Very subjectively, right? Bennett stated that the actors behind these wallets sully cryptocurrency's reputation through the use of this medium with Bitcoin being the most popular. Uh, this apparently impedes widespread adoption. So again, it's about the gains, it's about the adoption, but you have to ask, what are we adopting here? Like the initial goal shouldn't be adoption. The initial goal should be fundamentals. It should be human rights before you shove this stuff out into the world and have everyone using it to be tracked, traced, and perhaps blacklisted by their governments. So that would be my take on that. Warnings of future implications. Ricardo Spaghini, a fluffy pony in on the matter, stands as a former developer of Monero. Bow, bow, bow. We love it. Known in the space as Fluffy Pony. That's right. Uh, God bless you, Fluffy. I think he's out of jail. I think he's out of jail. We ought to hit him up, have a chat. He said a suggestion on Twitter, warning that this could serve as a slippery slope for the crypto space. So he was already in on this stuff. He already knew what was going on. 
It's only a matter of time till most Bitcoin mining pools are forced to do this transaction filtering. Key. Based. 100%. It might be time to dust off P2P pool. Focus on Stratum 2 uh, V2 support for pools. Uh, I'm so low IQ compared to these guys, honestly. I mean, you guys watch me. You think I'm smart. But when it comes to uh, Spagny and uh, German guy, uh, you know, I'm I'm like uh, in the little, little league, right? So... More water. My mouth is dry tonight. I think it's all lack of sugar. I literally have had zero sugar today. That's why my mind is kind of uh, glitching. Transaction censorship was something he speculated could potentially become widespread, primarily thanks to regulatory pressures. The concern Spagny had was that regulators could start thinking this is a good idea when it comes to extreme cases such as OFAC and their crypto list. Yeah. 100%. Stuff to be aware of, guys. Thank you, Ali. I appreciate it. Not now, Neil. I apologize. I will call you back. An OFAC compliant Bitcoin miner revives debate about transaction censorship. Okay, so... Um, now we're talking about Marathon. This is a different mining pool. So check this out. Um, Marathon has dedicated its extensive hash power to an OFAC-compliant Bitcoin mining pool, which filters out riskier Bitcoin wallets. Now, this was August 5th, 2021. Uh, this was November 2020. So again, we're seeing more developments here, aren't we? So... The new pool verified its first block this week, featuring a remarkably abridged transaction list and limited block rewards as a result. The crypto community has reacted to Marathon's style of mining as a means of censoring Bitcoin. Correct, of course. Uh, sanctions compliant. Yeah, so these companies you can invest in, and we've talked about this before, where to get exposure to the profits of Bitcoin mining, you know, you don't have to buy... You know, ten thousand dollar ASICs rig. You don't have to uh, use a lot of electricity at your house. You can literally just buy stock with one of these companies. Now, there's probably more risk to that. The cash flows maybe are a little bit better from Bitcoin mining, uh, but there is an initial cost in order to get involved. And more people are just going to opt to invest in these companies, especially if we go into another speculative phase. Because I imagine with these companies, you can get some leverage, right? Uh, versus Bitcoin. Now, let's let's look at their performance uh, in the past year or so. Uh, $2. Does that say $2? Holy moly. Gee, Luigi. Uh, yeah, so this is at $2 back in October of 20. And now it's at 40 So, big moves, guys. Huge moves. So... Yeah, uh, a lot of people are just going to opt to do that. And if you do that instead of mining it yourself, well, it's just more centralization. These guys are literally going to comply with OFAC. And as more hash power gets concentrated in companies which can pull off economies of scale, and we've seen in Texas how some of these Bitcoin mining operations are making deals with the government in order to get subsidized energy. And so that gives them a competitive advantage from a profit standpoint over you know, smaller time competitors, which can't get bulk energy deals. You know what I mean? So again, economies of scale is going to kick in. Uh, and that's problematic. It's problematic. And there are dozens, I think, of Bitcoin mining companies you could buy on the market right now. And another one that you could buy, and I think we mentioned this earlier, is Bitfury. Now, this is a European crypto company um but they have a subsidiary here in the united states by the name of cypher mining uh so you could probably get yeah so here we go in march 2021 bit fury formed a u.s based subsidiary uh cypher mining which will go public in a merger with a blank check company so a spac um so you can invest in that so it's going to be easier to invest in Bitcoin mining companies in the population, which is not 
awake to the problems that we're going through here, they're just going to be like, oh, cool. Why mind it myself? I'm just going to go invest with these guys. And mind you, I said this in a tweet. I want to pull this up so that we can take a look at it so that you guys can sort of understand the issues here. Um, let me get down here. I was doing a lot of Twitter stuff today. Go follow me on Twitter. I got some pretty OG takes, but check it out. I said, as institutional money moves into Bitcoin, which most people think is a great thing, cool, institutional money, more gains, right? Um, but as more institutional money moves into Bitcoin, presumably, they will also want mining profit exposure. Just as you know, you get into gold or silver, you don't just want to have the physical gold and silver. You can get leverage. You can get cash flow by getting exposure to uh, mining operations, right? You get cash flow from that. You get a dividend. And so more institutions are going to want exposure to those, which means more economies of scale um, right there. This means more economies of scale in mining, right? This means more centralization, correct? Why am I saying right and correct on my own thing, of course? Uh, this also is due to decreased rewards and likely higher energy costs through time. More centralization in mining amongst public institutions means more regulatory initiatives and compliance mandates by governments. This ultimately means there's a higher capacity for successful blacklisting of addresses and financial censorship by the likes of OFAC. Therefore, more institutional adoption, more censorship potential on Bitcoin. Can anyone refute this? I'm still waiting for a response. So, yeah. Yeah, more centralization is coming. It seems pretty obvious to me. There seems to be a lot of coping that says, no, this is not the case. I don't see why that's not the case. With everything we've talked about today, if you guys can offer a counter-argument as to why more centralization isn't going to happen, I would be all ears. But I think it is. And therefore, OFAC and these other regulatory agencies are going to be able to have a tighter grip on the Bitcoin blockchain. Because, again, as that Redditor had noted, these companies are publicly traded companies, which means they have to comply with the law. I mean, and complying with the law is obviously one of the... Uh, um, it's, it's something that you do as a corporation. I don't even know why I need to say that, but it's a fiduciary responsibility, right? Which is, you know, the mandate of all corporations. Um, and so it's not like they're going to, you know, be anarcho-capitalist, uh, you know, human rights people and say, hey, this guy shouldn't be blacklisted. We should include his transaction in our block. Mine it. We don't care if we get arrested. This is about human freedom. Uh, with the corporations you see nowadays, you think that's going to happen, especially when we when we notice who is behind who some of these companies, uh, investment banks, MasterCard, who we've talked about, Digital Currency Group? I don't think so. I don't think so. Uh, and especially Galaxy Digital. Uh, that guy's a Goldman Sachs bro. He's not an anarcho-capitalist. He's a Democrat, mind you. Um, and I'm not trying to introduce politics here, but basically if you're a Democrat nowadays, you're basically a communist um, as far as I'm concerned. Um so, or just hardcore socialist, either way, right? You're not libertarian. You're not, you know, let's get rid of the government type. Um, that is problematic. So that's what I want to say there. Um, so beyond simple issues of throughput, extending these types of wallet checks has been extremely contentious among the crypto industry, yet yeah, the government doesn't care whether it's contentious or not. They're going to do it. Uh, many identity measures like Maripool as threats to Bitcoin's promise of censorship-resistant self-sovereign transactions. Um, yeah, these corporations are not going to risk their initial investments, uh, you know, their gain capacity. Just want to note that. They're going to comply. Uh, so this is Marathon Digital Holdings. I was looking at their website. One of the largest Bitcoin mining operations in North America. And same thing with Blockstream, one of the biggest. And so <laughs> it is kind of interesting, right, when you see these companies talk about decentralization. Uh, because it's quite the opposite, in my opinion. Um as Marathon continues to deploy more powerful miners, we increase our hash rate and therefore our probability of earning Bitcoin. Uh, and mind you, if you read this website, there's nothing here which says Bitcoin's going to lead to human freedom. Bitcoin's going to lead to a new financial model which circumvents central banks. We're going to defeat the banksters, right? It's just like, yep, 
this is how we're going to make money off this. Uh, we're going to comply with the law. This is our operation as to how we're going to make more money and more money and more money. There's nothing here about, uh, you know, freedom and liberty and whatever. Right? So that is something to note. By remaining ag agile and leveraging our scale, we can neg negotiate favorable contracts and quickly adapt to changing circumstances. Blah, blah, blah. Right? It's just about making money. So that's just something I want to note. And I looked at their investors. Uh, to figure out if I could recognize any names. Uh, I didn't see anything particularly interesting. Here's the board of directors. Uh, Akamoto. <laughs> I imagine that's why he was chosen. Sounds a little like Satoshi. Uh, Mr. Akamoto. I'm sure he gets that a lot. Uh, Lehman Brothers, bro. So that's interesting. Is there a trilateral commission in here? Is there a CFR in here? Uh, no, he just looks like a bankster. A small level bankster, but nevertheless kind of a bankster. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba, featured as a guest speaker on CNN. Okay, so, yeah, totally anarcho-capitalist, right? Uh, Fred Thiel. Thiel sounds familiar. Is he Peter Thiel's brother or something? He used to be the CEO. Uh, well, yeah, you can read into all that stuff. I don't see anything particularly interesting in these guys, as I mentioned before. But maybe you could uh, find some interesting things like Money Today Show. Maybe you're looking into this stuff as well. But, uh, yeah, nothing too particularly interesting. But we do know that they're looking to comply with OFAC, which is interesting. Um, yeah. So let's go next. How many Bitcoin miners are there? I think they had mentioned how many Bitcoin miners they had. I think they had like, you know, a uh, hundred thousand miners or something like this. I don't know. That's not what we're looking for. Let's go home. Yeah, they have 133,000 miners. And they're expected to generate 13.3 exahash. So that's quite something. 133,000 miners. And I was looking at uh, an article from 2019. And what's interesting is they're trying to estimate how many Bitcoin miners there were out there. Because I was trying to figure out how big... 133,000 miners were, but look, uh, how many Bitcoin miners are out there? Well, it's not really possible to zoom in on a number of Bitcoin miners. It's safe to say that the number would easily be north of 300,000. Okay. Why wouldn't they say 400,000? Why wouldn't they say 500,000? Easily north. I mean, it better be easily north because 133,000 miners now uh, if it's not north of a million, there's your 10% right there, <laughs> right? Uh, so I don't know how many miners there are, but, uh, you know, I'll have you guys speculate. I couldn't find more information on that. I did look because I was interested in that question. So, all right, moving on. This is a slog of a video. How far are we? One hour, 18. Typically, I like to do an hour, but this might be two, uh, but we'll see. I might just check out of here soon. Our Bitcoin mining services. Co-location. Host your Bitcoin and mine at one of our state-of-the-art mining facilities in North America. So again, North America, which means FATF and OFAC. Let's learn more about their co-location. Your miners in safe hands. Uh, is your Bitcoin safe, though, is my question. Because remember, it's not just it's a store of value like gold is. It's like in your hand, it's yours. You don't have to rely on nodes or miners or energy infrastructure. That's why I question whether or not Bitcoin or crypto in general is a better store of value than precious metals. Uh, because with crypto, you got to rely on other people and you got to rely even more now. Um, especially if you're somebody like me, right? Uh, who's not exactly friendly towards uh, the government. And more so, they're less friendly towards me. It's not even me being unfriendly to the government. They, they just have, they're not friendly towards the population. Okay, I mean they're not very nice. Uh, they're not, they're not serving the interests of their people. I don't know why I need to go on this rant. You guys understand, but, uh, yeah, I mean, 
just that's not cool. Reliable infrastructure. Our facilities are purpose built. Advanced power. Yeah, so they make ASICs machines too. So just more vertical integration. Decentralized mining together. <laughs> it sounds a little bit uh, of like a koan, right? One of those like Buddhist koans. What does that mean? We decentralize by teaming up together. Is that right? Uh, under one government, right? The more participants involved in Bitcoin mining, the more secure the Bitcoin network. Uh, yeah, it's more secure, uh, I guess. But if you guys are all being regulated, it's not exactly secure for some people. We go further than other co-location providers, ensuring that you have granular device by device control of your Bitcoin mine through our co-location management platform. So you can get exposure to their mining, which is going to be regulated as well. So, um, investment, did I check this out? Expanding participation in Bitcoin mining. Yeah, so the BMN uh, lowers barriers for entry for qualified investors. Providing exposure to Bitcoin mining through a simple token purchase, right? So you don't have to set up Bitcoin mining yourself. It's just easier to go through Blockstream. That's how they're going to sell it. That's how centralization is going to expand. World-class facilities. Now, I'd like to know how many miners they have. Um, that's something curious to me. Aren't you curious about that? I'm curious how many miners they have. Um, but I, I guess we don't really know. But here is the next article or set of articles I'm interested in sharing with you. So check it out. Blockstream and Macquarie to form carbon neutral Bitcoin mining. So we talked about this earlier. To me, this opens up a door that I don't, that I don't think people know the uh, Narnia-like outcome to, right? Like where does this lead if we're going to be focusing on being environmentally friendly with our Bitcoin mining? Uh, I wish, see, this is what happens when you don't stand up and argue for the truth when people are just saying false things and employing false initiatives that seemingly don't affect you because they invariably do at some point. Like a lot of people are just like, oh, well, we'll let the crazy people who think the world's going to end because of like this carbon stuff, we'll let them just do their thing. We'll let them go crazy. It's not too big a deal. Well, now, I mean, it could be that they you know, make it so that you have to have severe uh, restrictions placed on your Bitcoin mining operations to make it less efficient so that you could prevent the world from flooding or whatever they think is going to happen, right? Um, so that's something to note. Uh, bring together Blockstream's market-leading Bitcoin technology and Macquarie Group's expertise in financial energy and commodities markets. Green infrastructure, oh boy. Blockstream is pleased to announce a new partnership with Macquarie, uh, to pilot a Bitcoin mining facility and explore carbon neutral alternatives for such facilities. Um, I imagine it's going to be expensive, right? I imagine it's going to be pretty expensive. Uh, the first pilot project will utilize Blockstream's enterprise grade mining facilities. Um, yeah, renewable energy. Um, interesting. And In setting up renewable energy it would be more expensive in my opinion than uh, just using you know oil off the bat or coal or whatever um, so a higher barrier of entry is sort of what I'm seeing here as one of the largest Bitcoin miners in North America with a vision to scale this initiative to new sites as green power infrastructure is deployed Blockstream is excited about the potential for this collaboration Macquarie is one of the world's leading investors in renewable energy infrastructure with 44 gigawatts of generation under development. Okay. So, pretty lame stuff. And just take a look at this, guys, just for your curiosity. Look at the level of vertical integration that Blockstream is doing. Okay, they've got the Liquid Network, which supposedly makes your Bitcoin a little bit more private. They've had some issues recently. Uh, Lightning Network, um, Blockstream Satellite, so you can check out the 
Bitcoin blockchain, as well as Blockstream Explorer. They have wallets. They have mining operations. Um, many side chains, right? So this is interesting. They just have a lot going on over here. A lot going on. And one thing I wanted to point out, right, is that Macri is one of the main investors in this company, uh, Bitfury, which is one of the biggest Bitcoin mining companies in Europe. And I imagine in Europe, especially, there's going to be this climate initiative because of the Claris Climate Report, or goodness gracious, um, the Paris Climate Accord, right? Um, and so they're probably going to be working with Bitfury to make them as well more environmentally compliant, which is going to push more small miners out of the mining sector, in my opinion. Like, you're probably going to need permits. You're probably going to need government licensure or um, acceptance in order to get involved in Bitcoin mining. Um, and these institutions are able to do that because they're able to build the infrastructure in an environmentally friendly way, which means centralization, in my opinion. And another name you'll see here is Mike Novogratz in Galaxy Digital. Now, again, Mike Novogratz was a Goldman Sachs boy. Wikipedia says he was on the Investment Advisory Committee for the Federal Reserve. I couldn't find more information on that. Could be true. But, yeah, he's definitely on an inside level. Uh, but one thing I want to note, come down here, Galaxy Digital now mining Bitcoin with Blockstream. So Galaxy Digital and Macri, investment bank from Australia, are both getting deeply involved in Bitcoin mining. And we see this so, so often, guys. If you watch this channel, this is nothing new to you. You see the same people, you see the same names that are involved here in um, uh, blockchain news, in uh, mining, in, uh, in, in exchanges, and in many things, in many different parts of the blockchain sector. You see the same names all the time. Um, so there's a lot of centralization going on. And this just plays into our new crypto world order reality that we're starting to see come around us that a lot of people are just not awake to, um, which is why we're just, you know, going 180 full on speed the other direction into uh, privacy coins, right? Freedom, freedom coins. So, yeah, this is something I wanted to note for you guys. Um, the same people are getting involved in the same stuff. Centralization's going on. So, uh, yep, 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 yep. Mining firm is in Netherlands. It's about $1 billion worth. They have that subsidiary we talked about. Uh, yeah. And then we'll, and so I wanted to get into this environmental thing a little bit more too. Will industrial scale Bitcoin mining impact the environment? And so again, we'll see more of this talk. And so again, this, there's going to be more. Uh, there's going to be more centralization as a result of this. Maybe it's the pretext for centralization. I'm not sure. I imagine it will be. I don't think that everybody who's involved in this stuff believes it. They can't, in my opinion. I mean, it's just become so unbelievable at this point. This whole, the world's going to end if we don't establish global technocracy, right? But people believe this stuff. People are so influenced by fear. People are so influenced by fear. It's so sad. They still don't know that this is the methodology by which they spook you into giving up your rights, into giving up your most valuable thing that you could give to the next generation. It's not wealth. It's not, you know, uh, you know, um, antiques or whatever. It's rights. It's your freedoms. And we've been so spoiled because we've received all of these freedoms in our early lives that we didn't value them properly. We weren't taught to value them properly, especially by the baby boomers, right? Nevertheless, not to go on that rant, a little late for that, but uh, somebody was saying that, <laughs> this is so funny, right? Somebody was getting angry at this uh, Bitcoin mining operation because they said 
in addition to supplying power, the company was doing industrial scale Bitcoin mining. They have about 15,000 mach machines. And they said that producing power requires millions of gallons of water to be drawn from Seneca Lake to help cool the process. The water is then permitted to be sent back into the lake. So they're using the water in the lake as a way to cool uh, things, the process, I guess. And because the water is making the lake warmer, <laughs> okay, this is making people worry about the health of the lake. They're saying that it may disturb the balance of the ecosystem. So it, it's not just carbon <laughs> it being introduced into the environment. It's you're warming up a body of water, right? So again, I'm not an ecologist or whatever. Maybe that's a problem. But you're going to see more of that. Uh, oh, you want to build a factory here so that you can mine Bitcoin? Uh, that's a problem. You're going to need you know, to go through a 10-year permit process. Or you know, you're like a little dude in your house wanting to uh, you know, mine Bitcoin. Well, we're going to have to see about that because that could uh, contribute to some carbon problem or something. I don't know. They'll come up with some stupid thing. I assure you. I assure you. So just more stuff to check out there. Uh, you know, Bitcoin uses a lot of power, blah, blah, blah. Um, and by the way, this is a point that we've made a lot before. But energy prices are going up significantly in places like China, Europe, um, India, etc., all over the world, really. Uh, because of this ridiculous initiative to uh, be so gung-ho about renewables replacing fossil fuels, which is, by the way, one of the most risky initiatives that humanity's ever embarked upon. I mean, we, we have here an accessible, reliable source of energy. And I'm not saying it lasts forever. Of course, there need to be different alternatives which pop up, namely nuclear. We've talked about uranium a lot here on the channel. Uh, uranium was up like 15% today. Again, we've just been way ahead of the curve. I hope you guys get, got in on the trade. But uh, it, it's like we didn't even plan for <laughs> what would happen if we didn't have enough reliable energy as a result of this transition. Like Germany had shut down like 15 coal power plants. And they're like, oh, we're just going to use solar. It's going to be fine. Not. <laughs> and now they're going to have to get a lot of their gas from Russia. And we've talked about that with Gazprom. Again, Gazprom's outperforming, doing incredibly well. And they're going to continue to do very well, which is what we anticipate because of all this ridiculous stupidity on the behalf of the world, thinking that this is uh, as easy as everyone says. Now, I'm not saying it can't be done. and I'm not saying the technology won't improve, but uh, it, it's very just infantile, puerile, uh, insidious, I, I would even say. Maybe it plays into the whole Great Reset thing. I mean, who knows? Maybe they're just trying to cut off energy to people as part of this new uh, population control program or something. I don't even know. But, uh, yeah, this is definitely going to play into crypto mining, 100%. 100%, which is why, again, Monero is super key. Um, we'll go through this 10% thing a little bit. Uh, so that you can get an idea as to what he's talking about here. And I'm largely just going to read this for you because uh, some of this stuff goes over my head. Again, I'm not as technically savvy as Bednar or Spagny or German guy, right? But I'll read it for you so that maybe you can get a perspective and maybe help us out here on this channel get a better perspective if you were oriented that way. So a small thread about Bitcoin censorship and why it probably does not need 50% hash rate. Imagine you are an honest miner that likes Bitcoin. You create your own blocks with transaction you choose. You know for sure that the 10% of hash rate is censoring transactions according to publicly available blacklists of uh, unspent transactions. And they also orphan blocks that include censored transactions. So if they orphan blocks, then all those transactions don't get processed. Because others don't want to join in on mining a block which has censored transactions in them, right? Uh, and I would imagine at this point that it's over 10% of the hash rate which is being censored. Now, don't quote me on that, but with everything that we just read and the rollout of OFAC and digital analytics expanding and everything that's going on right now, I would imagine we're over 10%. Um, but... I, that's speculation. I'll let you guys research that. If you find a block that includes this transaction, 
Oh, excuse me. Sorry. Let me go back. I, I hope that you guys are patient with me. I'm sorry. I'm tired tonight, but I'm trying to get through this. There is a new block ahead with a blacklisted unspent transaction with high enough fee that you would include it in a block. The fee is $5, higher than the next transaction that does not make it into the block. You'd love to be a good Bitcoiner and include the transaction. However, you find a block that includes this transaction, you are risking it. Not will not be in the best chain. Um, Ten percent of hash power will straight up orphan the block. Uh, then it's a bet if your transaction will be in the best chain. But ten percent will choose the chain where your block is an orphan. Others, it is fifty percent. Right? Upside five dollars more in transaction fees. Good feeling that you are being a good non-censoring Bitcoiner, and I don't think most Bitcoiners care. I don't think most Bitcoiners care. E even the little guy. I mean, we're assuming in our uh, diagram here, in our analysis, that even the smaller guys, like all of them are going to want to mine these transactions uh, that are you know, on these OFAC lists. Who knows if that's the case? Who knows? Um, maybe it becomes easier and easier to make your mining operations interoperable with the OFAC blacklist. Um, and maybe if you do have to go through a permit process, even if it's not too hard of a permit process, they make it so that your machine is set up with this OFAC list automatically, uh, or they make you sign some affidavit or something. I don't know. But um, yeah, just that's something to note. Downside, 6.4 Bitcoin in a block reward with 10 times 50% probability. Cost benefit, cost benefit analysis in dollars. $5, the value of being a good Bitcoiner, Minus 0 0.01 times 0 0.5 times 6.4 times 16,000. If you value being a good Bitcoiner at 1,000 US dollars, the cost benefit is a negative $4,115. So maybe it is a good idea not to include this transaction. It does not matter if you think it's a good idea. If others do so, the 10% goes up. With 20% hash rate censoring, it's minus $9,235. So... It goes up more and more and more as uh, the opportunity cost goes up more and more and more as more centralized Bitcoin mining operations are included in the OFAC grips, the OFAC regulatory compliance apparatus. Uh, and it's not going to be just 20%, I suspect. It's going to be more than 20%. But then again, you do have a lot of mining going on in El Salvador. And who knows? Maybe that's where a lot of the mining goes. Um, that's, that's something to note. Could be that a lot of money just goes there. We'll see what happens. Cause if regulation gets too bad in the States, maybe they just go to another country where it's a little bit easier, but who knows? Who knows? Just thoughts. Um, also note that nodes are censoring, uh, sorry. Also note that nodes that are censoring are excluding the non-censoring hash rate, meaning more rewards for them. So if you join the dark side and also orphan the non-censoring chain, you will even make more in block rewards. Everyone is motivated to kick out the hash rate. This is a case of minority rule, as described in The Most Intolerant Wins, Dictatorship by the Small Minority, by N.N. Taleb. This is interesting. Uh, Nassim Taleb, kind of smart guy, right? And he's not big on Bitcoin either. But yeah, you could read more into that. It's an interesting case. He introduces some statistical analysis into that. Um, I was going to get to this, but I'm just too tired, guys. You can tell how tired I am, right? And I'm going on a trip here pretty soon, uh, and I'm going to bring my GoPro with me. Thank you to Lutz. I appreciate, uh, or was it Lutz? I can't quite remember. Um, but... Yes, I'm going to be going on the trip. It's going to be awesome, and we're going to have some nature videos for you guys and some other vids as well. Maybe I'll make some vids outside of Starbucks, and maybe I'll get those uh, hipster dudes who work there to get into Monero. That'd be cool. Ah, oh, man, we're blurry again. I thought I fixed that. Apologies, guys. But anyways, we're not on top of the game, it seems, today. Some things are not going our way, but that's fine. We'll be back soon again to fight for liberty, fight for freedom, fight for Christ, and to make the world a better place. So, Monero Mateo, I hope that you guys enjoyed this. Um, let me know what you think in the comments section. It's a little bit longer video. If you made it through, thank you so much. 
Check out our donation links below, guys. Check out the um, social media links as well. That's all. Um, Love you. God bless.